Well, thanks again, uh, everyone, for joining us today for our 25th installment of this webinar and extending back to 2012. I'm, I'm sure that many of you who are immersed in the post-grant practice will uh, joining us and observing that 2012 seems like an eternity ago for post-grant given its rapid evolution. Uh, today, uh, we've got a lot to cover as usual. Uh, it's an eclectic grouping, and this time it involves a combination of, of motions to exclude, prosecution bars, and CBM developments in general. I'm Carl Renner of the Fish and Richardson's Washington, D.C. office, and today I am joined, as usual, by Dorothy Whalen from our Twin Cities office, who co-chairs the firm's post-grant practice with me, and also by each of Andrew Patrick, who, like me, is based in our D.C. office, and Ron Vogel, who's based in our New York office. So we welcome them to today's program. Dorothy, you can advance the slide, too. Oops, I am on so, Oh, there you go. I'm not seeing it yet, but it'll, it'll come soon, I'm sure. So <laughs> as usual, slide two shows you our agenda. It begins with a uh, typical manner of, of an overview of our series and stats before turning to the earlier mentioned topics. And in slide three, we go to the context and the housekeeping. Uh, with context, there's two things primarily that we wanted to cover, as usual. We're we're wanting to give you the context that's provided through a brief overview of the series history itself. And that mentioned earlier was the 25th hour web, webinar session is, is today. And with these webinars beginning is a mechanism designed really for Dorsey and I to, to pull our heads out of the sand of the particular cases and on regular occasion to assess you know, particular parts of governing laws and rules. But we long ago evolved these webinars to address specific and practical issues that are experienced by us and others of you who listen to these webinars, you know, our goal is, is really simple. It's to uh, keep ourselves fresh kind of globally and also to highlight to all of you a subset of the issues that we, we find that help us to raise awareness um, amidst our practice and then we think might help uh, the community at large to, to keep up with the, the developments that are of most import. And so in essence, we really just want to make this tool as good as it can be and therefore viable in the long term. To get there, we monitor decisions and rule changes and, and cases, and we identify specific issues of general interest, both on our own and with the help of others, um, of you really, that are bringing some of these to our attention, knowing that if we discuss them, we provide everybody the opportunity to think them through and enhance all of our collective understanding of the issues uh, that we're going to make this tool what it can be. Second, the context of, of the speakers themselves. Uh, it's always good to know who you're hearing from and, and what they're talking from in terms of perspectives. Um, as mentioned, I'm joined by each of Dorothy, Andrew, and Ron. And while each of us are patent lawyers, technologically we speak from pretty diverse backgrounds. Uh, my education in early engineering work was grounded in electrical engineering and physics with a practical experience development at the Department of Energy. Dorothy's training began in chemistry and engineering and has since broadened to all the disciplines that you might might expect a, a well-rounded patent attorney to, to cover. Andrew combines economics and mathematics degrees, and somewhat similarly, Ron combines finance and chemical engineering degrees. So uh, we hope that with these diverse backgrounds, we can give you a pretty broad perspective on the topics we're talking about today. And, and from the practical standpoint, we've got substantial experience in the firm and, and individually with uh, representation of petitioners and patent owners alike, with really more representation than any other firm in the, in the nation on post-grant, we're able to, to learn rapidly how to implement things both from the petitioner's and the patent owner's side, seeing the weaknesses uh, and the strengths from each, and hopefully complement the other. Uh, most importantly, from your vantage, we're really going to be presenting from the perspectives of practitioners focused on what's happening rather than really naval casing over what might or should happen. Um, but that's enough context. Let's wrap up slide three by looking at a couple of quick housekeeping items that it reminds me to cover. First, CLE. Um, as with our prior webinar, CLE is available. Amidst the slides, you're going to see offered a code for those who are barred in New York, and we'll, of course, vocalize that if you're not seeing the slides so that you can get your credit. If you have any questions or problems, just reach out, and we're happy to help you get your CLE credits. Second question, during our talk, we keep the telephone line muted uh, to avoid disruptions to allow us to get through the content, but we really do desire and, and welcome your questions. And they can be submitted using uh, the webinar's chat interface that hopefully you, 
can get a sense of. Uh, time permitting, we'll address all the questions uh, either in line or at the end of the hour if we don't get to them in line. And if not, we'll follow up afterward. And third, resources. You know, several are noteworthy. Webinars, um, if you've missed the past webinars that we've looked at, um, issues, you can access them online. There's a, there's a link available to you. Uh, practice tips um, and post-grant, the app, uh, we have push notifications that are becoming available through it, but also just general information for those of you who are uh, iDevice users. Uh, statistics, uh, you know, with, without any further ado, I'll, I'll ask Dorothy to review those and uh, before we turn over the presentation to uh, Andrew and Ron to jump on the substance of the motions to exclude. Uh, so Dorothy, if you wouldn't mind. All right. Thanks, Carl. And welcome, everyone. I'm waiting for slide four to pop up. There we go. Well, what are we seeing you know, this, this, this month? Well, for IPRs, the PTAB continues to be a lively jurisdiction. We've got uh, over 1,400 IPR petitions filed through the end of June. There are 184 filed in, in June alone. So uh, the PTAB, we know, is continuing to add judges. And so far, they're keeping up with their workload. But, they, but it's, it's, um, things are hopping there. What are we also seeing? Well, most uh, petitions continue to be granted. Um, again, on typically a subset of the grounds presented, that's a consequence of the redundancy doctrine. One of the things we are starting to see, though, and we are going to do a deeper dive into this subject because we've been studying all the petitions decisions to date, is we're seeing I think a somewhat heightened bar, particularly in the area of obviousness. You know, one of the things the judges had told us earlier is they thought the petitions were somewhat weak on motivation to combine or motivation to modify. And we're starting to see that carried out into some of the petitions themselves, even at this early stage with the PTAB holding that the petitions do not even get over the reasonable likelihood of success uh, hurdle, which is a, a pretty low one. So in any event, that's, that's something for the future. But, um, you know, I think the takeaway here is while most petitions continue to be granted, we are starting to see what I think is a heightened level of scrutiny. Yeah, um, Lucy? And, and with, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, real quick. And with the burden on the parties to bring evidence at the earliest possible opportunity, it's a warning flag for petitioners to make sure that you're really putting your case forward in its fullest you know, light. At the, at the stage of filing, uh, they are denying these things at the outset, like Dorothy mentioned, and it's, it's really a beacon for folks to look at. Now moving to uh, CBMs. Again, we're still, obviously, there, there are going to be fewer here. Again, the, um, there are more restrictions on the number of patents that are eligible for CBM. But still, you've got 187 through June 30th with six, six filed in, in uh, June alone. And we're going to talk in, uh, later in the, in the webinar about a potentially interesting use of CBM in the uh, Hatch-Waxman context. Um, you know, again, similar trend with respect to IPR. Most petitions granted, but on a subset of the grounds presented. Final written decisions, these are starting to roll in. We've got 85 IPR final written decisions through July 2nd and 11 in, in CBM. Most have found all claims unpatentable. There are some notable exceptions. I just saw one come through recently with uh, TRW where all the claims were, the patentability was confirmed. And of course we have the Corning DSM family where there are I think about 10 petitions where almost all the, the, the claims were upheld. Still. It's proving to be a pretty good jurisdiction for um, attacking validity. Only one motion to amend has been granted to date. That was in the International Flavors case. And as we, we covered that uh, topic last month, it was a pretty extreme situation. And it's still not surprising, given, given the high bar associated with motions to amend, that we haven't seen any more granted. Uh, stays, I, we're not going to really cover them in, in depth today. We'll refer you to our website. Again, most continue, most con motions for stay continue to be granted. However, it is jurisdiction related. 
or dependent, I should say. And in addition, we're seeing more and more judges start to impose conditions as a, in, in order to uh, obtain a stay. And then from there, I think we'll uh, turn it over to Andrew and Ron on the topic of motions to exclude, which has been, uh, I guess, on, on everyone's minds these days. So Andrew and uh, Ron, take it away. Okay, thanks, Dorothy. So um, we're going to be talking uh, at first just generally about motions to exclude um, the application of federal rules of evidence and the objections um, that are ultimately carried through uh, by the motions. Uh, but then after that, we'll go through some specific cases and examples uh, to try and show application of these principles. Um, on the slide, you'll see just kind of briefly, federal rules of evidence do apply in post-grant proceedings. And in particular, uh, the PTAB has stated uh, that parties should treat evidentiary issues in those proceedings uh, just as they would in a case that's pending before a U.S. District Court. Although they do caution um, that parties can be sanctioned for advancing frivolous arguments, for misrepresenting facts, for engaging in dilatory tactics, and for abuse of discovery. Um, and in particular, it's because the USPTO duty of candor does apply. So on our next slide, um, we talk about objections to evidence. Uh, timing is extremely important, um, and there are really kind of three scenarios. Uh, when dealing with an objection to evidence that's been submitted during uh, well, pre-trial during a preliminary proceeding. So, for example, uh, evidence that's sub been submitted with a petition like a declaration, the objection has to be served on the opposing party within 10 business days of the institution of the trial. After the institution, uh, any objection has to be served within five business days uh, of service of the evidence to which the objection is directed. And finally, uh, there's an exception uh, with deposition evidence the objection actually must be made within the deposition itself. And setting forth an objection, it's necessary to identify with sufficient particularity uh, to allow correction in the form of supplemental evidence. Um, and that supplemental evidence can be filed uh, within 10 business days of service of the objection. So for example, if there's an objection uh, as to the authenticity of a document that's been submitted, um, the objection has to state uh, particularly uh, what those issues are such that uh, the party that initially submitted the evidence has an opportunity to back it up. So moving on to motions to exclude themselves, um, they're necessary to preserve any objection. Um, the motion can be filed without prior authorization from the board, although we've seen in many cases that the filing party does um, kind of check in with the board and ask about uh, whether it would be proper to include certain arguments. and the movement, uh, the party filing uh, the motion to exclude, does have the burden of proof to establish that it's entitled to the requested relief. In terms of timing, um, the timing during which motions to exclude can be filed is going to be set out in scheduling orders. Um, and typically, that falls midway through the trial, um, in particular after the merits briefing cycle and before the oral hearing. Now, in terms of content, um, on the next slide, we have a quote from the board saying, a motion to exclude must explain why the evidence is not admissible. So for example, it might state that uh, it's irrelevant or the evidence is hearsay, uh, but it cannot be used to challenge the sufficiency of the evidence to prove a particular fact. Um, so in terms of scope, you can't use this as a server reply. Um, you can't challenge the sufficiency. And it's emerged that it's not proper to attack um, what might be termed new arguments. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, but the particular parts of a motion to exclude, bare minimum, uh, includes identification of where in the record an objection was originally made. So for example, um, there might have been an ob objection raised during a teleconference, um, and the moving party would point that out. Um, there needs to be an identification of where the evidence sought to be excluded was relied upon. Um, and then the objections that are included in the motion to exclude, they have to be listed out in numerical order, and each one must be explained. And so these are kind of the bare minimum requirements that the board has set out. Now, the numbers uh, that we have on the next slide are, are very interesting. Um, what we've seen is that in the overwhelming majority of cases, motions to exclude have been denied. 
Um, you'll see that over the past 12 months, uh, we've done a survey of, of cases. We found that in 126 instances in which these motions have been considered, 62 were denied, 46 were denied as moot. Um, there were six instances in which there was a denial in part and a granting in part, and ultimately out of those 126, only 10 were granted. Uh, but as we get into on our next slide, even in those cases where they were granted, uh, in the vast majority of those, uh, what was dealt with were actually procedural issues, and it wasn't actually uh, a decision on the motion itself, which would come later on in the process. So, for example, um, these procedural issues included uh, determinations that uh, there was an authorization to file a substitute motion to exclude, um, determination that a party could file more than one, um, and determinations as to the kinds of arguments are proper to include. Uh, with regard to um, the substantive issues where evidence actually was excluded, and again, this is very rare, um, it either dealt with the issue of new evidence, and again, uh, the board has, has now stated clearly that they don't consider that to be a proper issue to raise in the motion, and so we'll deal with that in more detail later on. Um, and then in some instances, uh, it dealt with a hearsay objection. So why are the numbers this way? Um, you know, again, it's an overwhelming majority that are, that are being denied. Um, on the next slide, we have a statement from the board uh, as to their uh, basic policy considerations. Um, and it can be summed up by saying that the board's policy really does disfavor exclusion, um, or in another formulation, it favors inclusion of the evidence. Um, and actually, if we could back it up by one, um, we have a quote here. This is from Liberty Mutual Insurance uh, v. Progressive, and so it's on slide 16. Um, and this is where they just kind of laid it out for the first time. Um, they said that there's a strong public policy for making all the information filed in a non-jury, quasi-judicial administrative proceeding available to the public. And in particular, the board states that they have the discretion to assign appropriate weight to be accorded to evidence uh, that they are, of course, capable of determining uh, how much weight would be appropriate, uh, whether it's um, full, a little, or none at all. And they state that it would be better to have a complete record of the evidence submitted by the parties than to exclude particular pieces. And so on slide 17, we're going to start getting, getting into details of particular cases, um, starting with a case that, you know, again, uh, kind of starkly laid out this, this policy disfavoring exclusion. And in particular, in Corning VDSM, uh, the patent owner had moved for exclusion of exhibits um, submitted by the petitioner that contained uh, what they uh, identified as inadmissible hearsay and also inadmissible hearsay within hearsay. Um, and in particular, what was at issue there was a communication between counsel for DSM and counsel for the inventor, uh, where the inventor had disputed um, their obligation to assign rights to the invention to the company. Uh, the board actually stated within that decision that they found uh, the petitioner's arguments as to why the evidence was not hearsay, quote, unconvincing. Uh, nevertheless, they denied the motion to exclude. And in doing so, um, you know, again, they iterated they have the capacity to assign appropriate weight, and as such, uh, they prefer to have a complete record um, to facilitate public access rather than risking error by excluding something. Moving on to slide 18, uh, Ron is going to take us away with a discussion of hearsay cases. Uh, and after that, we'll just move through uh, various issues that have popped up. Okay. Um, like Andrew said, we're going to begin here with some specific examples of motions to exclude, uh, beginning with hearsay. Um, and as mentioned, the uh, federal rules are applicable within these proceedings, and we have seen quite a bit of uh, discussion on hearsay through some of these motions, uh, cases where the, the board has held that it's a non-hearsay because it's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Here, uh, however, we do, the, court, the board is willing to dive into the particularities of uh, the rules of evidence. And in EMC Corp, we had a case where the patent owner argued that a reference, it was a user manual that was disseminated uh, publicly with software should be excluded as unauthenticated and inadmissible because no witness had personal knowledge 
of that document existing prior to the critical date, which was critical. And uh, it also generally argued that electronic data is inherently untrustworthy because it could be much easier, easily manipulated uh, at any time as compared to a hard copy. The board rejected both of these arguments, uh, citing uh, FRE 901A, which basically says that a uh, evidence to support a finding that the item, the, what the proponent claims, can be shown by there. So on, basically it said that neither a declaration from the author nor evidence of someone actually viewing the document prior to the critical date is required to support that finding of what the document claims to be. And here the, it cited that the experts, although they had not personally looked at the version of the document cited as personal, as prior art, had sufficient personal knowledge and working experience to provide competent testimony. And it went on to say that um, regarding the inherent untrustworthiness, uh, that an uninterrupted chain of custody is not a prerequisite to admissibility. But again, this goes back to the weight. So this kind of jives with their general policy statement leaning towards admissibility and judging with things by awaiting. On the next slide, we have another hearsay issue that went uh, a different way. Here um, in Corning, the patent owner challenged the sufficiency of evidence submitted to show a limitation was inherent in a reference. Um, the petitioner objected, uh, raised a hearsay objection. The patent owner attempted to argue that the documents generated post-filing in research laboratories were admissible based on the business record exception, which is FRE 803. Uh, the board rejected this argument and ruled that they were hearsay, basically holding, as the quote shows, conducting specific and unique scientific experimental work is not regularly conducted activity. It's not normally repeated on a regular basis. And these experiments involved in this case took place solely to address the issues of the case. Uh, it cited uh, precedent from its own precedent and Fed Circuit precedent, but it did say in, while it did not admit these documents, this did not preclude the expert from relying on them in forming an opinion. These documents had not been shown to be unreliable, the expert did not personally create them, and he was not spoon-fed spoon the data. Next slide. Another issue that's raised often is the lack of factual basis. Uh, in Corning, the DSM, uh, there was a motion to exclude test results because the expert did not explain how these tests were performed. The board rejected this and, as shown in the quote, uh, held that whether a witness's testimony fails to include underlying facts or data on which it's based goes again to the weight that should be accorded to the testimony and not its admissibility. Again, we're seeing this overarching policy. Uh, at this point, uh, the most important part of the presentation, I have to mention that the CLE code in New York is 002. That's 002. Next slide. Another common issue in motions to exclude is the lack of necessary scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge. Um, you see this where people are trying basically to knock out declaration testimony or stuff like that. Um, in Smith and Nephew, uh, the motion argued that the subject matter of the expert did not have the relevant knowledge to support the subject matter of the patent in suit, and that addressed the photo stability of a wound dressing. Um, again, the board rejected this and basically said that the objections to this testimony go to the weight and sufficiency of his testimony rather than its admissibility. And again, it is within our discretion to assign the appropriate weight to be recorded to this testimonial evidence. Next slide. In a somewhat related vein, uh, we have seen motions addressing either lack of credibility or consistency. Two Liberty Mutual insurance cases highlight this. Uh, the first issue raised in the uh, first case here, 
Uh, there were questions about the qualification of an expert because he provided false statements about his experience on his re resume. Uh, but the board rejected that, saying, again, the identification of two matters in the expert's descriptions of duty did not render the additional 192 matters irrelevant. Again, this any inconsistency could be addressed by the board in their weighting of the testimony. Similarly, um, in the second case there, the uh, double o, the, the 0009 case, um, we had something where addressing the reliability of a testimony of an expert because it related to something very esoteric, fuzzy logic, and the uh, expert in question did not have that esoteric knowledge. Again, the board held it's not necessary to exclude any portion of the testimony, and it would just affect the weighting. So again, the board is, uh, is very hesitant here to knock out uh, evidence. It feels that it is competent to address this all by weighting, and it's better to have a complete record. Two well, areas I, where... I just want to make one, one comment, though. Because it seems that even though the board is is unlikely to exclude, say, a declaration uh, based on objections to the expert's competency, in some respect, in some instances, it might still be a good idea to challenge competency in, you know, in your your uh, main brief, if only to uh, affect the weight accorded to that testimony. Yeah, Dorothy, that's an excellent point, and and uh, Dorothy's been part of proceedings where we've we've done that. We we did think there was a legitimate basis for asking for exclusion, but noting the the seeming mountain to climb on exclusion, it, it wasn't. We weren't sure how um, how effective a motion for that would be, but it was important to to indeed highlight that the expert just didn't seem to have the requisite experience to speak to the fact that they were being put up to speak to, and um, it was considered, if nothing else, an opportunity to make sure that, that everybody was made aware of that or reminded of that fact. Because, um, you know, obviously part of the expert's primary role is to, to show competency and the, the expertise that you're relying on in order to really put weight behind whatever they're testifying to. In fact, I think that given what you're saying, what, what's being said here, pointed out here with the broad policy against exclusion of evidence, um, I think maybe more and more the, the considerations over whether to file and when to file these motions to exclude, I wonder whether they don't um, bear more on what kinds of messaging you're trying to, uh, to make sure it's communicated. Okay, I'm going to uh, close with two examples where the board did in fact exclude evidence as either untimely or improper, and then uh, finish with uh, a little guidance on the proper scope of these motions to exclude. Uh, first, the board has excluded evidence as untimely um, in the Scotts Company case on the slide 23. We see that the patent owner submitted a declaration in rebuttal to petitioner's opposition to a motion to amend. The uh, board held this was untimely, specifically because it had previously warned against using this motion for this purpose. Uh, basically, it held that the majority of the declaration was in support of the original motion to amend rather than in rebuttal to the petitioners uh, to the uh, opposition to the motion to amend, and thus was untimely. And as I said, uh, this was particularly telling because the uh, patent owner had been warned to refrain from doing such. Next slide. The board has also excluded evidence as improper. In one of the Corning cases, uh, the petitioner conceded that the data originally submitted to support its unpatentability claim, which led to the institution of the uh, case, was erroneous, and it submitted new data in its place, which effectively made a new prima facie case of unpatentability. 
the board excluded this data because it said that basically this protocol would restart the case. And to permit the consideration of this data would be unfair to the patent owner absent any possible rebuttal period. Uh, quote goes on to say, we do not believe that it's in the interest of justice at this late stage of the case to impose this financial expense on the patent owner to respond to the new evidence. The board did note that challenging evidence in this manner as being improper is now disfavored. And that takes us into the next slide, which uh, shows that motions to exclude do have a limited scope. You basically, as it mentioned earlier, a patent owner cannot use this as a opportunity to file a SIR reply. Um, in Corning, the board held a motion to exclude is not a mechanism to argue that a reply contains new arguments or relies on evidence necessary to make out a prima facie case. Your progressive motion did just that, and it's a SIR reply. Um, the proper procedure is to contact the board. So in uh, we see the quote on the case below in the ABB, if an issue arises where whether a reply argument or evidence in support of reply exceeds the scope of a proper reply, the party should contact the board to discuss this issue. Ron, can we just focus on, just uh, stand this, this point for a moment, because this is coming up a lot, and in, even in looking at, um, at, at final written decisions coming out of the PTAB, the PTAB addresses this issue. Um, they've made pretty clear that motions to exclude are not the proper vehicle for dealing with, say, a reply brief that goes beyond the, the, the scope of, of the patent owner's response or even for, um, for deposition testimony that may go beyond the proper scope, uh, you know, say, of, of, of a declaration. But it's still, I mean, there's still an issue then of, of how, you, how you effectively deal with this, recognizing that it's, it's, it's out there, it's, it's part of the record. And I think what we're hearing from the board is them saying at least contact us first. And I think it does make sense to contact the board via email, even asking for a, for a conference, at least to flag the issue. A lot of times what the board will tell you is, okay, that's, that, that's fine, we'll deal with it in the, um, in the final written decision. And if we, if we feel that it's gone, beyond the, 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 the scope, we'll, we'll, they've actually said, we'll disregard the entire reply. But I still think it makes sense to sense it. If, if you feel that this is an issue in your case, to bring it to the board's attention, albeit not with a formal motion to exclude. I mean, Carl, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that score. Yeah, only that this case, I agree completely with you, Dorothy, that this case really sets out the roadmap for exactly that. It, it gives you the cover, if that's what you're looking for, but also the instruction to seek the board's help in dealing with the issue. And I think maybe that's the best way to frame your approach is we see that the scope has been inappropriately, we believe, expanded, be it in deposition, be it in this reply, and we're seeking guidance from you as you had asked us to do effectively in the ABB Roy case, or GBIF case. Um, and so here we are, we're, you know, we understand that a motion to exclude might not be the appropriate tool. What is the appropriate tool? I think we've heard some folks, um, and Dorothy, this might be worthy of kind of continuing the dialogue, but heard some folks ask us about this and, and respond in some measure disappointedly that you might not file a motion to exclude right out of the gate. Um, that they are concerned that the record would be tainted by the inclusion of the evidence that they're bothered by. Um, I don't think you're increasing your odds of success by just filing the motion to exclude without contacting the board. I think your, your greater opportunity is to engage the board as a partner and try to have them uh, help you out with this rather than, than take it on without their help and probably having them knee-jerk reaction and, and reject your motion to exclude. But, Dorothy, you've heard that request a bunch as well, and uh, and I'm sure I've seen people's reactions when we try to give them this guidance. 
Well, I have, and it's because I, I think common sense or you know, it's this natural reaction to say, I don't want this as part of the record. I don't even want you looking at it. But what they're saying is we're experienced. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not a jury. Uh, we have a lot of technological experience, and we're judges, and we can sort all this out and decide what weight to afford the the testimony, if, if at all. So, I do agree that in this instance, as uncomfortable as it is. The the best approach is to to is to contact the board and ask for a, a telephone conference. I mean, frankly, if it's if it's egregious, you may very well get them to rule on the spot. That's right. But that's right. Most in most instances, what they'll do is they will defer the decision, and you won't see it until you actually read the final written decision that comes from the board at the conclusion of the proceedings. Yeah, and, and there's another quote that was given on slide, uh, I guess, 16. You don't have to go back to it, but for people's reference, is the Liberty Mutual quote that was the policy disfavors exclusion slide that uh, Andrew had covered earlier. I think that couples well with the with the ABB Roji Biv case in in giving a sense of what the fabric here is. And if you try to push the board, our, my experience is the panels that were before. When I try to push them. To, to take a fairly what they see as a fairly agreed or um, a fairly aggressive stance on on the evidence, um, I I wonder if we don't push them away from just that. And, and I think again the the approach of having them help you come alongside of you and appreciating from your perspective what your concerns are, uh, they're going to see the arguments that are presented. They're going to see they are the decision makers. They will see all of this material. It's not like you have a jury and you're trying to prevent them from actually seeing the evidence. These guys are the decision makers. They are seeing it's like a bench trial, and so um, you know, just I would say, to folks, be careful how you're approaching them and understand that they uh, that they do see themselves as uh, an able body to handle the exposure to the the evidence and thereafter come up with a, a fair and informed decision. Um, so consider that when you're thinking about what you're asking for. But I still think you should flag the decision, flag the the issue for them. I don't think you should remain silent and hope for the best, uh, or that they'll Absolutely. notice. Oh my gosh, this this uh, testimony was clearly beyond the scope. I, I do think it's it's incumbent upon you to to at least raise the issue for them and plant it in their minds. Yeah, and and that reminds me of the expert uh, competency as well. It's this. It's very similar that you might have a record that itself through deposition transcript bears out the experts uh, you know, lacking nature in terms of what their experience is to speak to the fact that they're put forth to uh, support. But nevertheless, raising an issue like that, raising an issue like hearsay, raising an issue that clearly implicates the quality and character of the evidence is only going to do you a favor. It's really more of the approach. Um, that I'd be concerned with and how exactly you raise it. But Dorothy, you're absolutely 100% right on with that. I wouldn't leave it to folks. Uh, they've got a lot of material that, that confronts them. I wouldn't leave it to them to have to root out what you think is the egregious wrong, wrongness about the evidence. I would, I would point it out to them. It's just this case tells you how to do it and how to do it seems to be contact them, let them come alongside of you. They might invite you to put forth a motion to exclude but with the policy as it is, I think that would be the exceptional case. Yeah, I agree. So let's move on now and to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I say Andrew and and Ron. I you know you've been looking at these cases uh, very closely. I know in anticipation of this webinar, or mm -hmm. if you had other other thoughts on that or other color you wanted to add to it, given what you've with some of the things you've read uh, put forth. Yeah, you know, I, I think just generally along the lines of what you've been saying, I. I would not expect, uh, as a moving party, that you're actually going to um, re receive a decision from the board that's favorable to a particular motion to exclude, and it's going to be a very rare case where that happens. At the same time, uh, to the extent that they're saying that they do take these things into consideration, um, you know, that they they weigh the uh, the quality of the evidence and they you know take everything into account, it's absolutely worth raising the issues. 
uh, you know, it's just a matter of, of having realistic expectations about what the impact will be. Uh, it's not so much that it's going to be stripped from the record, it's that you're hopefully, um, you know, putting it in the mind of the judges that there might be issues that they should consider. And, and Dorothy, before we move, and I know we're probably going to run short, we knew we were tackling a lot of material today, but this is a really, it seems like a pretty important topic, one that we've heard a lot of questions on. There's one other item that I, I just I want to wait until we got done and had a good feeling for how this uh, policy, if you will, of, of of exclusion being disfavored played out. I, I still wanted to return to one slide that we had 19, and if you could, I go back to that because in that slide, I thought we saw something that was very interesting there uh, in the case with respect to. Um, how exclusions were, it seems like, found appropriate, um, and but the board had indicated here in this case that expert reliance on the material that was said to be hearsay would have been appropriate. And you know, as as parties that are trying to put forth evidence, when you are confronted with, you know, the best evidence you have of something might be hearsay in its form, or it might not be perfect in one way or another. That this might be something you you take a careful look at um, to consider whether or not it makes any sense to have your expert take a look at and and start to uh, help to inform some of the positions they're thinking about uh, based on that evidence. I would be careful how much reliance was given by my expert. I wouldn't want my expert's testimony to fall as a consequence having an inappropriate basis. But um, but nevertheless, it's an interesting case here, the Corning case and the quotes that are. They're here. I don't know if um, Ron, if you had any further thoughts on this. Again, I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the presentation when you were going through it, but I it was worth returning to for a moment. Uh, no, just I would, you know, would echo what uh, you said. But there, you do get the reading from the cases that they they stress proactivity, reaching out to the ball, calling them for these issues. Uh, as you know, the, the proper way to do it. So it seems like they they're encouraging you to get it, as you said, on the record, and that can only help. And if you were trying to get evidence into the record, if you were trying to well furnish the, the board with evidence to make its decision, is a maybe more a better way of saying that. Um, and you had evidence that was on the line between hearsay and not hearsay. You weren't really sure, you know. And you look at this case. Uh, would you be inclined to have your expert? Rely on it, or would you shy away from that? Dorothy, I'd love to hear from you on this as well. Well, I mean, I think it's just generally true that the expert, the, the evidence the expert relies on in itself does not have to be admissible. The expert can certainly rely on hearsay. Um, I, I guess I would make that decision on the, you know, the strength of the underlying evidence. Evidence. I mean, is, are is, Independent of what the expert has to say about them, do I want them them admitted? Yeah. You might try to do, frankly, both. You might actually present it in and of its own on its on its own accord, and then also have um, some part of what your expert's saying relying on it. Anyway, I just thought it was something interesting to see because we're looking at this generally as the party that is complaining of the evidence and potentially seeking to exclude. I think there's the other side of this to look at it from when you're trying to put evidence into the record, how do you most effectively do so and do so without exposing yourself to potential challenges despite the policy uh, that we're talking about. You know, and in Corning, the issue was a, an interesting one because it involved laboratory tests that mm -hmm. were done specifically to, uh, you know, for the, to support the, um, the, the petition. So it's a little bit of an odd situation. Actually, not the petition. It was to, to support the uh, party's position. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point, too. This was a post-filing. This is maybe a different issue. And it's so esoteric because the uh, that it is it aligned with, you know, board and Fed circuit precedent on the business. It seemed like they were trying to shoe horn this in. This seemed like a pretty easy non, you know, a hearsay decision. I don't know if all yeah. cases are going to be that way. Certain something you have to address before considering how to submit it. All 
right. right so shall we, shall we tackle prosecution bars quickly? <laughs> if I can get to my slide here. A second. I'll get there. I had to get you out of order there. Sorry about that. I know you messed me all up here. Well, I can. I can. I'll. I'll. I'll uh, as, I, as I struggle to get to my slide here, I will. I will just mention it. You know, one of the issues we've talked about in, in uh, prior webinars is this whole issue of prosecution bars, I and mean, they're common in litigation. You know, when you you've got uh, when the patentee has pending uh, applications, you you don't want uh, members of the prosecution team to have access to confident to the defendant's confidential information because you could turn around and take that information and use it to craft claims. Well, how is that playing out now in the context of post-grant proceedings? They're very different from prosecution. The PTAB is, has made that distinction, in fact, voicing um, its opinion on the subject, but ultimately it's the district court judge that has to decide. And there were a couple of cases that, that came up recently which we thought were worth bringing to your attention. The first one came out of the Eastern District of Virginia, involved a CBM petition, and the the defendant moved for a protective order that would have extended to the CBM proceeding. And in this case, what the court did was it, it actually cited the, the patent owner's ability to amend the claims during the proceeding, analogized it to an examination, and said, well, because of that, We've got to have some kind of a, of a bar in place. But at the same time, the court recognized the importance of coordinating strategy between the litigation and the CBM proceeding. It's a point we've raised previously because they're so intertwined with each other that your, your teams have to communicate with each other. And so what they did was a, adopt a compromise situation where they said, okay, what we're going to do is we are going to put a prosecution bar in place, but it's only going to extend to the patent owner's counsel having access to confidential information, but you can designate other members of your litigation team who don't have that access, and they could participate in the CBM proceeding. And again, it's trying to strike a middle balance. Another case coming out of the District of Delaware, this was Judge Robinson, and it's a you know a lot of cases are are filed in this district, so I think this case is worth paying attention to. Here, Judge Robinson sua sponte imposed a prosecution bar. Again, her reasoning was similar to the to the court in the Eastern District of Virginia because what she's saying is again you have the ability to amend, so there is the danger that the confidential information from the defendant could be used to inform amended claims. On the other hand, it's very important to coordinate the two, the, the two teams. And so she, again, struck a middle position where she had what I would call sort of a, a partial bar where members of the lit team who did not have access to confidential information were able to participate in the uh, post-grant proceedings. I think these raise some, some interesting issues. Because first of all, um, both, are recognize, both cases recognize the, how intertwined the litigation, the district court litigation and the post-grant proceedings are and the need for coordination. They also emphasize the motion, the, the patent donors, whoops, the patent owner's ability to amend. And yet we know from experience that the motion to amend in these proceedings is not like even inter partes re-exam or ex parte re-exam. It's extremely limited. Only one has been granted to date. So it's, you know, it's, it's a theoretical possibility, but one that is, has a vanishingly small chance of success. And I, you know, I, uh, I, I wonder here whether, um, you'd have a different result if the patent owner at the outset agreed, why are my slides changing here? Um, if the patent donor agreed at the outset simply not to amend the claims, I'm not going to file a motion, a motion to amend. Would that have changed the outcome? Would that have obviated the need for the prosecution bar to begin with? And I'm not talking about 
maybe extending to prosecution counsel, who may very well be prosecuting continuations, but just the uh, the post grant and, and and the lit teams. I don't know, but I mean it's something I just want to throw out there as a possibility. I also yeah, wonder if it favors. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, we've seen we've seen arguments made. It's interesting with respect to the question of what would happen if the patent owner agreed at the outset not to amend. Um, we've seen in the past where courts have have used that same logic to suggest that uh, you know lawyers from the same law firm had to designate either those who are going to be exposed to CBI or not, and thereafter uh, observe lines between those who are going to amend if there was going to be an amendment. And and we've also seen arguments put forward where parties have suggested that um, that during just the routine argument phase and the exchange of motions and um, and rebuttals and replies in the post grant proceedings that the patent owner could take advantage in a similar way of information that was confidential in nature to to craft their arguments in such a way that would keep the claim preserve the claims infringement with uh, with with maximizing the arguments over the prior art because they knew about confidential information and I wouldn't say surprisingly but I would say it's noteworthy that that we've never I've not seen a judge give credence to that second argument and that is I've seen consistently judges observe the idea that if a if a patent owner can amend they want to keep confidential business information out of the hands of those who will be controlling the amendments in the post grant proceeding and that that's what you see in the two decisions that you flag but when when facing the question of a patent owner has the ability to argue for distinction of its existing claims there's not as much sensitivity about that patent owner having access to the confidential business information and and there's just not as much of a the wall isn't as high so to speak so it, it seems like the balance you're talking about that these courts are starting to find they they seem to be observing the idea that there's a, there's more of a hindrance and, and an imposition on the parties and counsel to require a patent owner to get different counsel to handle these proceedings. And if, if you did have a patent owner disclaim their ability to amend, I think it would be pretty weighty. Uh, we don't see it happen, although we've seen some terminal disclaimers filed. Uh, it would be similar. We, we just haven't seen this kind of thing happen too much, though. Well, the other thing I would throw out is does it... Does it waiver? Excuse me. Does it weigh in favor of staying the district court litigation? Right. Right. But of course, that raises all the. You know, if you're Eastern District of Virginia, for instance, we've not seen much yeah, that's there. Not and, nope. And uh, even Delaware, you know, they're they're fairly conservative in their view on when to stay. You know, I, I think federal judges are. Concerned about prejudicing patent donors, and that's a, it's a fair concern. So it's a it just seems like a big balancing act, frankly, that's going on, and uh, it's a good question. There's no answer for it, sure. Uh, it's, it's a good question. And so maybe we can just, uh, in the remaining few minutes, um, just touch briefly on uh, interesting, potentially interesting development on the CBM front. You know, CBM uh, patents we traditionally think of in the, in the software area, financial transaction type patents, you know, inventory control, things like that. Um, recently, there was one filed in the Hatch-Waxman context, and it involved a, a patent listed in the Orange Book as a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. The patent was the subject of a Hatch-Waxman suit by a, a generic, uh, involving a generic challenger. And... I have, uh, I'm waiting for the slides here. Um, I've actually, I don't know what the problem with the slides is. Um, there. The, I, I actually reproduced the, the claim. It's over the course of several slides, and I won't dwell on it. It was a computerized method of distributing a prescription drug. It's not the kind of patent you'd ordinarily think of as CBM worthy, and we recognize that, of course, in the CBM context, that the uh, the definition of financial product or service, which is what the C one of the requirements for for CBM review is, would not ordinarily extend into the pharma area. But it would be very interesting to see what the PTAB does with this particular petition, because it's really starting to stretch the bounds of financial product or service. 
don't know if you guys have any comments on that. Other than it does look awfully, uh, well, I'm not sure if we should comment, but it does, uh, the way that the CBM statute has been interpreted, as we've covered in past webinars, it's a pretty broad swath. And as you can see from the claim, as you're showing it to folks here, Dorothy, there's perhaps a little less technology uh, in this claim than you ordinarily see in the pharmaceutical patenting realm. So if there's a patent that's uh, got less technology uh, and maybe a little more business orientation to it, you'd, you'd think that perhaps CBM would apply. Yeah, so again, this is we're, we're about five or six months away from, from a decision on the, on the merits here, but it's definitely one to watch, and we'll certainly be watching it. And let's just see if there are any questions we can answer before the hour is up. Let's see. I'm having trouble with I, I'm having trouble getting the, the what is your experience with how parties are addressing the scope of the bar, whether certain materials trigger the bar? Are parties finding ways to limit this beyond documents that the accused infringer merely stamps confidential? I, you know, honestly, I have not had too much of an issue with prosecution bars. And I can't say that there are any, there are certain materials that, 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 that trigger the bar. I mean, beyond the obvious, it would be, you know, what's your second generation product going to be? Um, I don't know if you guys have any yeah. thoughts on that score. I would say it's a tail wagging dog issue where the bigger question is, um, is who do you want to have performing each task in your team and then making sure that you're carefully observing what you're exposing your team members to, uh, the ones that are in charge of the patents, you know, in the post, in the post grant defense. Um, it's it's not as much about what the um, other party can do to you. It's more a matter of what you're how you're managing the information flow. I think on on your side that we haven't seen the bench particularly moved by. Um, I haven't seen them really taking heed of the fact of a particular case and excluding particular counsel as a consequence of what they've been exposed to, because parties have been it seems like pretty careful uh, to not overexpose. I'm yeah, sure I answered the question, experience. but yeah. And just uh, one observation from our colleague John Phillips, who says, who's, who comments on the pharma uh, claim that it looks very similar to music distribution patent, and all of those were actually found to be CBM eligible. And I think that's an interesting observation. So again, we'll we'll wait to see what the PTAB does here. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we're coming up on the hour. So um, I don't see any more more questions here. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Again, we welcome your suggestions. If there are topics you'd like to hear about, please let us know. Because again, you're, you're practitioners just as we are. And um, on that note, we'll look forward to seeing you next month.